Good day, fellow deal makers. Welcome to the Deal Scout. Hey, we have a returning champion who's over across the pond, who's doing global acquisitions, and he's going to come share some insights on how to buy companies, service-based companies, with 100% seller financing. So there's great opportunities in the market, what's going on in the economy, uh, to, to buy companies and buy them at value. So we're bringing our friend. Where are you at, Graham? Well, I'm currently in Dubai, but uh, most of our businesses are in the UK and uh, Europe. Okay. So Graham from over there is going to come share some knowledge and wisdom with us on the Deal Scout. So Graham, welcome back to the Deal Scout. Thank you, Josh. Good to see you again. Yeah. All right. So um, you're flying all over UK and you're, you're doing deals in Spain and Dubai and all these places. Like, Talk to us about some of the things that you guys are focusing on. Well, currently we're focusing on um, our, our main businesses are in uh, healthcare and uh, building services, building services in the, the renewables and green uh, and decarbonization sector. So not, not, not traditional uh, building or construction. We, we, don't really, we don't really get involved in that, but really where there's a specialty, specialism, um, that's the that's that's the two key businesses uh, for us at the moment. So healthcare and uh, buildings. Yeah. So you go in and you you take a look at these organizations, and the goal is to buy them and to roll them up into your holding company and operate them and grow them. Is that right? Is that your business model? That's right. Okay. Exactly right. Yes. Right. Uh -huh. So let's start with kind of like square one. How did you choose those industries and those niches to focus on? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I mean, certainly healthcare is, um, it's almost a no-brainer. You know, people living longer, you know, um, you know, uh, it, you know the, uh, everything about that globally, it's a global business. Um, it's, uh, you know, for, for us, good margins in that business. It's, uh, um, uh, you know, so, so for us, it's, it's, it's a sector that is just attractive. You know, you can get... Uh, it's pretty easy to fund that in terms of bank financing. You know, anything with a white coat, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to, easier, easier, I wouldn't say easy, easier to, to fund. So so that's that's one of the main areas in terms of the healthcare sector. And there's a wide range in there. It can be dentistry, um, you know, care homes, uh, care, uh, pharmacies, pharmaceutical stuff. So it's a full range within that sector. So it's a massive sector. Um, but really, um, for us, it's, uh, no, it, it's great margin, so it's it's, uh, it's one that's very attractive for us. Uh, so the money flows into it. So again, you know, we, we we just go where the money flows. In terms of the green and renewables, similar. You know, we believe that green is the new digital, if you like. You know, the uh, with, with the changes and you know climate change and uh, the 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 rules and um, you know that that are coming into play. Some are already into play, uh, forcing the the transition into cleaner greener energies. And cleaner, greener, uh, more energy efficient buildings. Um, again, you know the money's flowing into that section sector, and there are, there are no real because it's an it's a, an emerging market. There are no there are no real sort of, uh, massive dominant players in that sector yet. So we feel that um, if we can, um, you know, bring together a bunch of well run, well managed, you know, good, well established regional operators. To uh, you know, ge geographically, that we can pull them together, um, offering a, a range of services in the sector. We think we can really be a credible, uh, you know, a big, a big player in the market. And um, yeah, I mean, that's that's the plan. Yeah, this kind of sounds like you know, uh, studying like Pena on acquisitions. This kind of sounds like a a Pena move where you go into an emerging market, something new, a lot of chaos, but you have the ability yeah. to pull together into. Is that is that a, a path that you guys have learned through and and follow, or do you have opposition to what they teach? What are your thoughts? Well, we you, you know that's one way. It's definitely one way, and um, uh, so. You know the 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 Pena model very much fragmented markets. You know um, where you can consolidate it, and it's uh, you know you can have it where it's, it's just by getting scale, the value of the business. You know at the end, if you're exiting, you know is greater because of the size the size of the business and revenue and, uh, and EBITDA that you've created. So that's definitely one model. 
I think so that you can do that in just traditional sectors, though. It doesn't have to be too much of an emerging market. It could just be a traditional, uh, a traditional sector where we are seeing it on the, the green energy or the clean energy or the you know decarbonization of buildings. That is it is a fragmented market, but it also offers an additional value, we feel, uh, at the end by being one of the first players in of, 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 a, of a good scale, offering the full range of services where you can capitalise on the money flowing in through the government contracts that, that, are, that are coming out because they have targets to meet. Mm-hmm. So we see additional value in that rather than just a straight arbitrage play on um, uh, you know revenue and, and EBITDA. Um. So, all right. So, when you guys are looking at a healthcare company, which I I love healthcare for this reason, in terms of business, maybe you know, like the the fundamentals of this, people want to live longer, right? Mm-hmm. Like people don't want to die, so they're highly motivated when they need something to to pay it. They'll they'll find ways to to pay or to make it. Um, and when the government gets involved, it's messy. So there's mess and high motivation. So when you guys are looking at a healthcare target, you mentioned a potential deal in the U.S. that you guys are actually looking at. Like, what, what is a what's like the perfect deal where it's like maybe not too small, not too big, but it's just like right in your sweet spot. How do you look at that? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we look at it. I mean, let's if we're seeing dentistry, for example, you know, we, we you're really look we we don't buy, um, uh. I say mom and pop businesses. Mom and pop businesses, fine if there's maybe half a dozen employees and you know it's maybe turning over a million million dollars or a million euros. There's a threshold there that um, we kind of don't go below because it's it's difficult. You know, even though there is a big market for that, um, our uh, through our experience, buying them too small um, it creates problems. You know, in terms of time and management and, mm-hmm. and, and all that stuff, and that and that is hugely underestimated by a lot of people looking at doing acquisitions. So we've learned the hard way um, on, on that one. So we have criteria in terms of the management, who's going to manage it, are they capable of managing it uh, going forward? So it, it will depend in terms of the number of employees, but generally, you know, anything under half a dozen employees, we wouldn't, uh, you know, it doesn't really work for us. And, and but but the, 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 I suppose the threshold is, you know, anything less than a million dollars or pounds or euros, it kind of is too small uh, on that basis, even though there are some good deals to be had, but just too small, you know? Yeah. Cause when you, and you said you've learned this the hard way, which I, anytime someone says something like that, I want to know yeah. what did you learn? Right. Yeah. But when you, yeah. when you buy too small, it becomes a management yeah. issue that now yeah. you have to go do yeah. the work. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was some of the, the early mistakes that you guys have, you know, made with maybe buying too small? Give us an example. Well, we've bought some businesses uh, <clears throat> where we, they, we, we've maybe been approached uh, at, you know, you, you, uh, at United Capital level. The business has been too small, doesn't fit our criteria, but would make a good, if you like, uh, plug-in or addition to one of our existing entities. So what you're doing is saying, okay, yeah, it doesn't fit us. It's not for us, but maybe one of our businesses, uh, it would fit them and it would be a good add-on and, you know, they've got good, you know, the guys understand the industry and the sector and it's a well-established business. It just doesn't fit our criteria. Almost every one of them we've had problems with on a plug-in. So when we're saying, okay, we'll just fit it in, it'll just slot in. Almost every one of them has been has been hard going. And not just, not just on the financial aspect of it, but in the time management and the management of it. it there are just, it just eats time. You know, and um, so the smaller ones, I mean, look, you know, if you're starting out and you need to get in the game, yeah, fine, go for it. But but there, there is a real a part, part of these this acquisition thing that's underestimated, and it's the management of these businesses yeah. uh, going forward. So for us, the most successful ones we've had have been where, you know, the scale, you know, maybe you've got three, 400 employees, management team settled and all that stuff. We have very little... Uh, there's very little requirement for us other than, you know, assisting them with the strategy and the growth of the business. Day to day, we just we just are not part of any of it, you know. So the guys understand what to do. So they've been the ones that have been the most successful for us, and the ones we've had the biggest problems have been either at the smaller end or in the distressed sector end, you know. And that's uh, again, that's another one, you know, where we 
you know, we, we've learned the hard way in terms of buying distressed businesses. It's not really what we do. We're not about that. Yeah. It eats time is what, yeah. you know, what I heard. And you and I only have a limited amount of time. And even if we're hard, you know, hard, really working around the clock, we got to sleep. We got to have time for our family. We got to have time for ourselves, right? How do yeah. you, because you're doing international deals and running around the clock. It's five o'clock where you yeah. are now. It's nine o'clock yeah. where I am. How do you manage all that while buying all these companies? And I mean, give it, give an idea of how many companies you own now since, uh, since oh, you started. Craig, um, I, I mean, I don't know many. We've got one is like maybe 20 odd, you know, 20 odd, some, something like that. And all various shapes and sizes. Um, so maybe more than that, actually. But, but we have a good team of people and that's critical. You know, when you're going from small business to big business, I've, I maybe said this before, you're going from I to we. So we have a good team, you know, we have people based in these uh, countries that uh, that allow us effectively to operate almost around the clock. You know, we are here in Dubai, we're three hours ahead of the UK. We are up, we're, you know, we've done up at the German dinner, done all our things before the UK is waking up. So we've, so it actually works being ahead of the game, whereas if we were in the US, you're kind of chasing the day based on where our businesses are. So it works for us being this sort of side of the clock <laughs> rather, rather than rather than the other way, but we partner with people that are uh, are good and, and understand that local uh, local area and can operate in those time zones. I think for us, you know, it's it's we, we work our team of people that we uh, our, our group, our board, our team. We are all, if you like, workaholics. You know, we but we love it. We mm. all love it. So it's not like you know, nobody's thinking anything about picking the phone up. 24-7, you know, I work with my wife. So we, you know, we flew back from the UK last night. So, you know, our kids kids were here in Dubai. We just make it work and we've just always done it, Josh. So it's not something we consciously think about. Some things we do, you know, something you've got to just stop to, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to miss this activity or we're going to do that. And it, but even our kids, they just, they've, they've only known hard work and um, traveling and, and ups and downs <laughs> really yeah. that's it yeah yeah this is this is so cool um as a leader and i know yeah. we're going to get more into deals and such but when i when i speak with a leader uh i want to learn myself and I, there's other deal makers out there who want to learn how to grow into leadership you are now responsible for hundreds of yeah. people hundreds of mouths yeah. hundreds of families right and then if yeah. if you extend on that how many kids do they have and that's that's yeah. a heavy burden that you carry on your shoulder. How, yeah. Do you ever run into a situation where you're like stressed out, maxed out, where you just kind of want to like just turn off your your brain for a few days and <laughs> you know release that stress? Yeah, but I I think you do get that from time to time. Um, you know, it is a heavy burden. Not mm -hmm. a lot of you know a lot of people won't be able to cope with that burden you need to be a certain character you need to have broad shoulders you need to but it's not something we consciously is there every day in the front of mind it's always there i drove into one of our uh, businesses yesterday and i couldn't get parked in the car park and i'm thinking wow all these new cars all these you know all the people all the employees that work there and i'm going wow you know uh you know how 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 what we're doing and what we're creating as a, you know, it's other people's families and uh, wealth and livelihoods. And all. So, so now and again, you get this, uh, oof, you know, but uh, otherwise we're too busy just, you know, running towards the gunfire and just keeping going, you know. <laughs> I, I get it, man. Um, now, we're not at the scale that you guys are, but, yeah. you know, you've got you've got all day long people are depending on you, right? And you, and you can build teams. Yes. And, man, we're working yeah. on that so hard, building teams and people who can then take yeah. the burdens of certain things. But then you go home and you got, you know, you want to be a good husband or a good mm. father and you got yeah. other responsibilities and then your church is calling you or, a, yeah. you know, the school's calling you, asking you for money or asking you to raise yeah. money, right? Like, yeah. so a lot of stuff. When you're mm. going through this, is this something that, you know, you said you it's a certain character, right? Broad yeah. shoulders and such like that. Mm. Are there things that as you're going through becoming a, a better leader are there things that you're focusing on how to level up your leadership skills like what are you doing to intentionally do that 
Yeah, I mean, we we've done some fundamental. Um, we made conscious decisions to continue to test and and and, and test ourselves, see how we'll respond. You know, you never second guess yourself how you're going to act or behave in certain circumstances. But um, for for us, you know, we, we moved to to Dubai. Uh, we wanted to grow our business. We wanted to be international business people. That was, you know, with the, what you, we took our family. And we wanted to be in a different environment, you know, environment stronger than will. You know, we were, we were based in Scotland. That we, we kind of got to a certain point that it was, you know, big steps. You know, how are we going to grow from here? We were kind of, like, you know, we're really, our our ambitions needed, we needed to be with, a, uh, live in a place or be around people that are, have the same ambitions as us. And I think over the last 18 months, we've we've really worked at that. Um, we are now operating with people that are miles ahead of us. They're miles ahead of us. And uh, the conversations that we have with those guys, it's just, it's just inspiring. It, it, it gets the, the blood flowing rather than, you know, kind of where we were. It was getting a bit depressing. And, you know, we were getting to sort of everywhere you, you, you or the people you were talking to, it was a bit, a bit of a, you know, we, they weren't at the level that we wanted to be at, so we were kind of getting negatively processed, yeah. uh, if you like. So we we needed to we needed to break out of that. And don't get me wrong, you know, crikey, we still have the 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 the, the day to day challenges every day. Um, but uh, I think the for us to grow and how our business are growing, we really needed to do to, a big shift. And otherwise, you know, we'd still just be kind of going around in circles, I thought. Yeah. I live in a small town called Ocala, which is in central Florida. And uh, I built a, I started building a fitness technology company back in like 2012. And it, nobody in my area knew about building a fitness technology company or working in venture capital. So I had to move my family to different areas to learn stuff. Yeah. Uh, because like in Dallas, Texas, you know, there's VC groups and there's angel groups and there's big tech groups and such like that. So I had to like you, I had to expand my network and be inspired by people who are yeah. doing something much greater than yeah. me. And now I'm bringing it yeah. back and we're, we're growing that here. But that yeah. was, for me, that was vital because yeah. I, I, I'm the kind of guy that I have to see it to understand it and then I could believe it. Mm -hmm. So interviewing you, I'm like, okay, I can do that because you inspire me, yeah. right? And I, yeah. and I appreciate <laughs> you doing that for me. Thank you. Um, as you're growing, building, um, one of the, the topics that you, you wrote about in, in the show notes was 100% seller finance. So we're, we, we approach a group, we, you and I, we're, we're working on a deal together, and we, mm -hmm. we approach a, uh, a company, yep. and we're like, oh, let's see if we can you know, scoop this up with seller finance. You know, what does, how do you do that? Like, how do you approach that conversation? Because uh, that's not a traditional way of thinking, right? Like, hey, I'm going to buy your company and you're going to finance it for me. How do you approach yeah. that? Well, I think, you know, it's certainly not a traditional way of doing things in Scotland or the UK or um, or Europe. Mm -hmm. um, but but it, is, it is more so accepted uh, that we've seen in the US. I mean, when we've looked at some, you know, uh, uh, investment material, you know, they'll quite happily say, you know, seller finance, you know, uh, available or part seller finance available. We, we, we wouldn't see anything like that mm -hmm. in, in the UK when we started uh, building our buying, uh, building and buying our businesses. So it truly was an alien concept uh, and is still to a certain extent. I think it depends really on, it depends on the deal. It depends on the circumstances. You go back to motivated sellers. You go back to, you know, is there an impending event? Is there a, uh, you know, what's the situation of the the seller? So for us, our starting starting point in terms of when we're looking at the financing will always be, can this be 100% seller finance? Now, we, we might not bring that out until way later on down the road uh, in terms of, uh, you know, that, but, but that's an hour mindset can this be done is there an opportunity for that to be done if we hit the seller with that straight away we wouldn't get anywhere you yeah. know so so there's a process that we go through it's uh it's a filter you know that we go through yep that fits our criteria then you've almost got a secondary filter 
Right? Is it possible? Then uh, you know, is 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 this an option on a, on a sale of finance? And what could happen is <clears throat> anything can happen during the diligence uh, stage or through the discussions that open up an opportunity or open up the opportunity to have that conversation regarding uh, seller finance. Um, so it really just does, does depend on the circumstances of of the deal on the seller and um, what they're what they're looking to get out of it. Um, so for us, you know, we, we've had it where, you know, maybe maybe the bank, you know, we went to the bank, the bank said, we, we don't really have an appetite for that, for that sector at the moment. Um, so we go back to, to the seller and tell them that. Then all of a sudden they come up with certain um, solutions. Mm. Okay, why, how about if we do, you know, X, Y, and Z, would that work for you? Or, you know, so, you know, during the process of it, rather than hitting them straight away with, you know, we want 100% seller finance on this. Some some people run for the hills, you know. Yeah. What I what I like about this is in your conversation, you guys are having a conversation. You're going through on your side. You're going through an acquisition process. You have a process yes. that you're approaching this, and then they're getting you know they're a motivated seller, and they're oh. if if the process fails at some point, they're coming up with some solutions. Well, what yeah. if we? What yeah. if we financed it? What if we yeah. worked our way out of this, yeah. right? Super cool. Yeah. And I think that what's important there, and that's why it goes back to 101, you need to find motivated sellers. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're trying to twist people's arms, um, it's it, it's a hard one, you know, very difficult then. Um, the, 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 normally, if if you're the, if you're so desperate to do the deal and the seller isn't, um, then normally these conversations or these opportunities during the, the dialogue don't appear that much. You know, they, they're not there. But on a motivated seller, um, absolutely. You know, uh, and that's why your, your filter, you know, you're your, um, dealing with, you know, the, the deals themselves um, are crucial. So it's a numbers game, as you know, and making sure that you get uh, as quickly as you can to the motivated to the motivated sellers and it's what you guys do you know you guys in the deal flow you you know that yeah here's some signs that we see where there's a motivated seller these are things that we look at that uh kind of stir up this is a motivated seller versus a non-motivated seller right you'll have these non-motivated sellers where they're not responding responding to your emails they're kind of ghosting you they're yeah. they're just not interested in even talking about it they'll they might jump on a call to be nice but yeah. those those waste time. Like yeah. we find that when people are getting older, they don't have a succession mm -hmm. plan. You know, maybe yeah. they're going through a health issue <clears throat> or financial yeah. issue. Now mm -hmm. they want to talk, and they're yeah. leaning into you as much as you're leaning into them. Right? What yeah. are some signs that you've seen on how to identify, even from the outside looking in? What are some mm -hmm. signs and signals of finding a motivated seller? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, what you, what you just said there is absolutely what we see when we're looking. When we're so we have uh, uh, we operate when we're going hunting. Mm -hmm. So we don't normally buy through traditional sales agents. We go hunting. So we have uh, we have some technology that allows us to uh, filter heavily um, the uh, I mean, really really cracking piece of kit that we that we work with. That gives us, you know, if the sellers want a, a contract recently, um, the age of the directors, how long they've been a director, um, actually it links into their social media. They can link it to their social media activity. So to see, it doesn't say specifically health issues, but if there's a motivation, if they've liked something. So it really profiles the, not just only the business, which is great, but the actual uh, owners of the businesses, what, you know, if, if everybody's in their 60s and, you know, have, have they got any kids in the business? All of that stuff. So it, you can get right, you know, really detailed because the ideal seller for us is someone, you know, uh, early 60s, um, you know, their kids have no interest in the business. They don't have any. And uh, there's maybe, you know, three or four of them and they're now looking at an exit. So they have an impending event. So we like that. You know, we, we like those people because they are then motivated and they maybe haven't really thought about the exit. You know, they've just 
going on and on and on. So when we go and knock on their door, we say to him, look, by the way, um, that's just something, you'd be, have you thought about an exit, you guys? Then you just plant the seed and, and you know, take it from there. Yeah. But that's the ideal, that's the ideal seller is, you know, is, is that, that age group or, you know, they've maybe um, won a contract or lost a contract or, so we, 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 we go, we dig into that information to find out the personalities uh, involved in it. Cause that's, that we don't want to waste time. You know, we don't, you know, we don't have, you know, if, if it was, it's no point us trying to twist people's arms to sell the business because it makes the deal a lot tougher. Yeah. Yeah. This doesn't have to be like a leveraged buyout or a hostile takeover, right? Like this is, no. these are, this is a, uh, a motivated seller with a motivated buyer and it's a, it's a good deal for, you know, for everyone. Um, I, I love this. I love these conversations about like the, a mutually beneficial buy, right? Yeah. A good deal for, for mm. both parties. Now, when you're talking with them and you know, why would someone sell to you? rather than sell to another group like why mm -hmm. why what what's your value proposition where a seller who cares about his employees and and the the legacy of his business why would they choose you guys well we, we do make a big point to that i think uh you know in terms of we don't interfere a lot in terms of operation day-to-day -day operations we we are there to support and help and assist and grow the business so we have different uh sort of real hardcore private equity uh, model, if you like, in that sense, you know, we're, we're light touch. Um, so we want continuity in the business. We want to uh, retain where we can the existing management team and support them in, in, in growth and give them opportunities throughout our group. So, you know, if somebody wants to move to Dubai, for example, from the UK, you know, so we want to offer, so, so we, we talk about a lot of the soft stuff, you know, what that, that's important. We talk about, um, what we're trying to create and, and achieve. Um, and I, I think, you know, listen, you know, when you get down to the hard nuts and bolts of it though, a lot of it's down to, you know, what's the deal? You know, what's the deal? What's the cash? What's in it for me? So as much as, as, much as the sellers, you know, can give it, you know, I've worked with these guys for 40 years, the bottom line is they're selling, <laughs> they're leaving them, you know, they're going. And that decision has been made. So there might be a conflict for a, a sorry, not a conflict. There might be a bit of a, you know, they're going through that process for a short while. But, you know, when, when you come up with it with a good deal, um, generally that, that would get it done as well. So yeah. it's the deal and um, uh, a lot of the soft stuff. And, and, and it's relationship built up over a number of, um, you know, we get to know these people over and we keep in touch with them over a number of weeks and months going through the process. Yeah. Yeah. I, so, you know, for groups that, you know, you're a light touch, you're, you're focused on growth. You don't want distressed, right? No, you either no. want plateau or growth yeah. and you, and you want to help someone take that trajectory. Yeah. And maybe at 60 something years old, they're just tired or lacking some yeah. motivation, or they, they want to go spend more time with family or the grandkids or travel a little bit. Mm. You could come in yeah. as a strategic to help them grow. Yeah. I'm uh, sure. That's interesting. Yeah. Man. What is your favorite part of all the business deals that you're, you know, you're doing, you're, mm -hmm. you're running companies, you're buying stuff, you're traveling, mm -hmm. you're doing a bunch of stuff. What's your favorite aspect of the business? My favorite aspect is buying the businesses. I mean, I like that better than selling the businesses. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, I just, I just love buying businesses. I like going, you know, getting, getting underneath the hood. If you like, I like seeing what they're about, meeting the people, um, you know, learning new things about them, seeing the opportunity. And I think the one thing that we do have, and certainly it's probably one of my strengths, is identifying, seeing opportunity and acting upon it. So, you know, we can see value and we can see where we can create value and seeing that through and, and structuring the deals to get us, to get it. That's what I love. Um, I don't like running the companies at all. I, don't <laughs> I do not like it. <laughs> um, I, um, you know, I, I, I just, you know, there are people far better skilled and uh, uh, just better at it than me. I, I have no, uh, that's not what I do. We, we, we identify opportunity and act upon it. And I think 
I think that's it, really. You know, that's now that sounds simple, but um, it is uh, in whatever sector or industry or you know, the wind, you know, you were going that way today, the wind changes direction, we need to move over there. And, and um, because it does, you know, a huge, huge scope of opportunity over there. And I think that that's what we that's what I enjoy. I, I enjoy that part of it. Yeah. The Sometimes I got to get out of my head because like, I love the deal. I love closing a deal. I love business mm -hmm. development. I love hunting. I enjoy meeting people, right? Like, I love that. I do not like the management. I do not like systems, processes, the operations it's needed. There's people out there who love doing that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. and for me is getting that out of my head and, and releasing the control. Mm. Now you have scaled to a tremendous, you know, uh, milestone. Was that hard for you to release control when you were first getting started? Yeah, absolutely was, and I think it's. I mean, it's still even difficult for my certainly my wife who who enjoys the operational part of it. You know, I the, the thing was when we were starting a business, small business, you were everything, weren't we? You know, we're everything. We we have operations, we have accounting, we have we're, we're all of it. We're yeah. a cleaner. Um. So and and actually, we're pretty good at it as well. You know, we're pretty good at the operational side, but we were you know we're relentless. We were. We were on it, so you're always kind of then you know when you introduce new people, they maybe just don't do it the way you need it done or want it done, and, and, and all of that stuff. So, so that 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 was a difficult process. I think the bigger you get, it's not possible to do it. So it's it's easier, you know. It's not but it's not possible for us to manage our businesses. We manage the group of companies, but it's not possible for us to manage uh, the businesses. And I think one of the things as well is. You know, because we were so involved early on, it's difficult for others to think that, you know, that we are not involved in the operational aspect now, where we don't, you know, I could not tell you what goes on, you know, on the day-to-day -day, uh, level in my business. I don't, you know, I would not be doing my job if I was in there doing or under or doing their job. So, uh, we, you know, I, I, it became easier, but it was difficult because it's like handing over your baby, as you know, to someone else, you know. That takes a level of trust, faith. Mm -hmm. It takes a level yeah. of like, all right, I don't know what's going to happen here, but it's got to mm -hmm. get off my plate. And you could, yes, you could have KPIs and check-ins to make sure, yeah. you know, there's accountability to make sure. But at some point, yeah. you got to have faith that it's going to do something without you. Yeah. yeah. Talk to us about the first time you did that on a big level and what was going through your mind. Well, I, I think... I can't remember the first thing, but what I can tell you is, is how we've seen both sides of that, yeah. where we have been majorly let down, where we have, you know, we say one of our strengths is loyalty, but it's also one of our biggest weaknesses as well as loyalty, where we, you know, the only way to trust somebody is to trust them, then until it, it, it uh, you know, it, until something happens, but that's it. Otherwise, you never trust anyone. So we say, well, if we want to really scale our businesses and grow our group of businesses, we have to believe and trust in people and allow them to get on and do, do what we hope and want them and need them to do. But we've been let down. You know, we have been heavily let down where things just, you know, just weren't so. But on the other side, we've had we've got some fantastic people that work for us that, um, you know, we don't even need to say anything to them. We just know they're on it, they're at it. And um, they're doing everything they can uh, in the best interest of the business, in the best interest of, of us and themselves. So there's a real mix. There has been a real mixed bag. And I think, you know, yeah, you're gutted when, you know, when, when you're when you let down, where people are telling you something that wasn't so, or, you know, you know, and it comes back to hit, to bite you. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it really is. It's like a knife, you know, in the belly. It's, 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 um, it's gutting. It's gutting. But yeah. what, you know, that, that can't stop, you know, you know, you have to, you know, and it can't put you off, you know, trusting others as well. It's just right. What do we learn? You know, right. Okay. You know, what, what uh, and um, if we're going to continue growing our businesses, we need to prepare ourselves for that could happen again. Yeah. It's so true. Um, the, the thing that hurts me the most, like I've, I've built businesses. I've lost money. I've been bankrupt. Like I've gone through the, the, 
the hardships of business and I've seen the other mm -hmm. side, you know, of, of good growth and stuff. The hardest thing for me was when I got, I felt betrayed or I felt like someone let me down yeah. or someone didn't follow yeah. through or someone burnt me or stole from me like that. Yeah. That was yeah. injuring. Um, yeah. Yeah. But my, my purpose drives me to try again, get back in there and, and trust again. Yeah. That's hard though. Sometimes. Um, yeah. How do you, after experiencing that, because you have hundreds of, you know, mouths and bodies, how do you get back in after getting burnt? How do you not go negative on people? It's difficult. You know, it's difficult in the short term. I think time's a great heal uh, on these things. But you have to keep your eye on the big picture. You know, you have to keep your eye on, on the prize and mm -hmm. say, well, there are going to be ups and downs. There's going to be twists and turns in all of this. And the reality is, in this, you know, business is a blood sport. You know, that's 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 where it is. If you are not, you know, if you don't have a stomach for it and people are going to let you down and upset you and hurt you, um, then it, maybe you shouldn't be in business. Maybe you should be working for a local government or something for life. You know, but because but, it, it's hard. That's it's hard. not easy. You know, you've got, it's the emotional part of it. And we have been, and my wife, um, she is, uh, you know, for her grudges are not just for Christmas. You know, she she keeps, she keeps them. Uh, uh, it's it, she t it takes her a bit longer to get over uh, get yeah. over certain things than me because you do. You know, you get hurt, and, and it's a very emotional uh, thing. But again, so you've just got to go through the process. But ultimately, if you keep your eye on the prize. I think that's the thing that keeps us saying, look, you know, come on, right? You know, if we're if we're going to grow and we're going to develop, you know, we, we've got to be able to cope with these things. Yeah. Now you have a, uh, you and wife are running the family business, running the, you know, the, the family organization, and you guys are, are partners, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is one of her greatest strengths? Here's, here's an opportunity, Graham, because you're my friend. Here's an opportunity yep. to get some major brownie points from the wife, <laughs> if she ever listens to this. Yeah, What's your yeah, favorite yeah. thing about her in business? Yeah. She, is, she is resilient uh, beyond belief. Um, she is uh, truly resilient. She we will be on the front foot uh, constantly. She will say to me, you know, if I'm ever feeling a bit down or maybe feeling sorry for myself or like my rounds, you know, Pull your socks up, right? Let's get back on it and let's get going again. So she's a real motivating, you know, pretty you know, tough, tough in that respect. And for me, that I like that because there's no days off, there's no time off, there's no feeling sorry for yourself, if you know what I mean. And yeah. she turns up. We will yeah. always, and she will always turn up and make sure that I turn up and make sure our kids turn up. And, you know, there is no, there is no slacking. You know, we just... You know, uh, and that's, I really admire that about her. You know, they're just, we, you know, we've got a job to get done. Come on, let's go. It sounds like you married up. <laughs> sounds, sounds like you did good for yourself, man. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Graham, let's do this. As you are, you know, we, we had a few conversations and you guys get a crazy amount of deal flow for, for yeah. businesses and, and uh, for opportunities. And, um, you know, for, for groups out there who are interested in having a conversation with you, or maybe yep. even, maybe even exploring, you know, taking some of your businesses that aren't a good fit for you, like what's a good place for yeah. people to connect with you and your team. You got an awesome team, by the way. I love those guys over there. Yeah. What's yeah. a good way for them to connect with you and do a deal? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the easiest thing is to go into the website, united-capital.co.uk and, uh, you know, to send in any inquiry there or. Uh, the guy that picks up uh, most of this stuff for us in terms of first line of inquiries is uh, Fraser.Kirk at united-capital.co.uk. He's the guy. But yeah, I mean, we are, uh, at this moment in time, our pipeline's huge. Uh, the opportunities out there currently in the UK and Europe are, are huge. And, um, it, you know, we've, we've, we, you know, we have a heavy filter for what we'll buy. So certainly anyone looking to... Uh, looking to potentially buy businesses in, in, in those countries, we'd be happy to talk to them and see if we can assist them in any way uh, in achieving that. Very cool. During this interview, are there any questions that I should have asked you that I screwed up and did not ask you? Oh, I think we've covered quite a bit there, uh, uh, Josh. I think maybe maybe just 
you know, the, the one thing is the current environment in terms of, uh, you know, the, the funding and financing and, and all of that. What we have seen certainly uh, in terms of that, that element <clears throat> of the funding market in the UK um, is, is certainly uh, that we have seen there are certain sectors where there is a lot more appetite from the banks uh, than others. Uh, to do it, there is a real nervousness, obviously, around everything with inflation and all that stuff, but there are still... What we are seeing is there are still some fantastic deals getting done at the moment, irrespective of everything else that, that's going on out there in the world. There are some fantastic deals going on. We're getting chased constantly. I mean, even before I came on this show today, you know, we're getting chased with guys. Listen, we've got two here. Can you have a look at them, please? Um, yeah. So, so, so there's, despite all the issues and problems and, and fear there, yeah, deals are getting done. Um, yeah. Deals are getting done and deals will get done. And yeah. if you look through any, you know, downshift in the market for the last 100, 200 years, right? Anytime there's there's a downshift, the the people who keep their head down, focus and, and do deals, they come yeah. out on the other end better. Yeah. Than yeah. when they got in. They there's value buys. When when people yes. are scared and and fearful, yeah. you could you could find good opportunities. So, I love that. Mm. Great great point because yeah. as deal makers yes you should pay attention to fear and let it be a yeah. kpi or like a metric in your head but you got to keep moving forward right yeah absolutely yeah. super cool thank you graham so much for sharing that and uh give a give a shout out to fraser when you see him tell him josh says hello and uh, do. Uh, the, the team over there so let's do this fellow deal makers thanks for listening into this episode uh with graham and my myself um, as always, reach out to our guests and say, hey, you know, like I want to do a deal with you guys. I'm looking at something over in the UK or, or Spain or, or all those other places that you're, you guys are doing business. And, um, you know, reach out to them. Say, I heard you on the Deal Scout. Let's do a deal together. Mission and purpose of the show, put deals and deal makers together. If you have a deal that you would like to talk about here on the show, we talk about all sorts of deals. Ecom, lemonade stands, SPACs, and everything in between those. Uh, head over to thedealscout.com, fill out a quick form, and we could talk about your deal here on the show. Till then, we'll talk to you all on the next episode. See you guys.